Hey, I'm Jeff Sinisak, actor, writer, and creator of Stop the Saturnians, and you're watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a very talented, not only actor and writer, but also a video game developer for a really cool game that has hints of Galaga, but is in its own right an amazing fun game that is currently on Steam. We'll ask him about other platforms that he might be on as well, too. We're joined today by the ever-talented Jeff Sinisak. How are you doing today, Jeff? I'm doing great. How are you? Better than my introduction, that's for sure. <laughs> so... Of course, it is always fun to see not only a, a talented actor in your own right, because I've loved what you have done, of course, in, in your past works as well, too, with some amazing uh, shows as well, too, like Code 8, The Boys, uh, a variety of other things that your IMDb is is very well versed. So uh, I do appreciate that. Uh, we'll talk about yourself as a writer as well, too. But but video game developers are, are a rare breed when it comes to interviewing on this show, because I've only had, in 13 years, three. So you'll be my third. Nice. <laughs> so tell us about yourself as a video game developer, and we'll talk about the game as well, too, for those that don't know anything about yourself. Well, I've been designing and coding games for literally 40 years. Um, I began on a Commodore PET when I was about eight or nine and moved from there to a Commodore 64, then into DOS, and then eventually into Windows programming. I've made probably 70 or 80 games, but through all the years, to me, it was always um, something I did just for the fun of it. So I would give away the games for free. And it was really the pandemic that forced me into thinking uh, in terms of, of going commercial. Because a year ago, you know, I was still laid off from my, my day job. Um, acting had slowed down considerably with the pandemic. It's still going on, but it was a, a slower year. Um, and I was thinking, you know, what skills do I have to leverage that perhaps can, you know, open some doors for me in a new, in a new arena? And I realized I'm spending you know, five, six hours a day coding anyway. What if I tried to do that in a commercial sense? So I picked up Unity and taught myself a brand new uh, C Sharp, a brand new language. I was previously working mostly in C. I yeah, created Stop the Saturnians, which is video game inspired by the arcade games of the 80s in the sense that it has overtones of, as you mentioned, Galaga, I would say Centipede, Asteroids, Missile Command even pinball to a degree with modern sensibilities. So more, you know, a, more of a, a shine and polish to it than those games would have had. And also a central story that evolves over time with a voice acting from myself and my lovely wife who voiced uh, the other character of Ellie. Um, so the story, story sort of comes into play more and more and things as things get more and more desperate for the human race. Well, I've gotten a chance to play it. And from what I've played, it's, it's amazing. I love it. It is oh, something that it is very rare to find games that relies on only two characters as far as I've seen so far. I, I, I don't know about anything else because I only got to level three and then I died. But, <laughs> but from what I did play and what I did enjoy, I think I thought it was well put together. I thought that the, the tutorials themselves were entertaining and interactive. And, and you get a sense of, of what you're trying to get yourself into. Kudos on that. I, I think it's oh, thank amazing. You. Thanks so much. Creating a, a game from scratch obviously is very, is difficult for those that maybe aren't initiated in Unity or initiated in, in video game developing. Creating a game in the pandemic, you know, maybe therapeutic or maybe it energizes you creatively. Yeah, I am. I'm one of those people who has to have a project ongoing. As long as I have some sort of project to work on, I wake up every morning utterly thrilled to get out of bed and get my day started at usually about three or four in the morning. I'm just out of bed. I can't contain my excitement. If I don't have a project, I am the exact opposite of spectrum. I am just a lost cause as a human. So it gave me something to sort of to get up and work on every day, especially learning a new language and that sort of thing. There was the thrill of, of educating myself as well. A lot of YouTube watching, but it was great because at the start, the game was wide open. I, I had rough ideas of what I wanted to do, but no specific plan. So I could literally pick at random YouTube videos on, on Unity and be like, hey, I never thought of that. That's interesting. How can I apply that? And every day I was learning and getting to apply something new, especially the first five, six months of working on it uh, was, was extremely thrilling. So what was the breakthrough moment for you where you where you saw that this game was really coming together? For me, it was, it was quite early on. The very first enemy that gets added to the game, that, that, that got added to the game, and the, the very first enemy you face, and the very first level, literally the only thing you're up against is asteroids. Stop the Saturnians, to be clear, is about uh, an invasion of Earth from Saturn. 
And Saturn, of course, is surrounded by a big ring of asteroids. So their first method of attack is they just corral a bunch of asteroids and hurl them at the Earth. The very first level, you're only facing that. And to be perfectly honest, when I started, when I first introduced those enemies and began playing it, I was having a blast just with that to the point where I called my wife and I said, you know, check this out. What do you, what do you think of this? And she was, she was actually trying to convince me that, hey, you know, you can make a mobile game with just this. This could be, you know, the, the, this is fun enough. But I was like, nah, man, I got grander ideas. So at, at that moment, though, I thought if, if it's fun already with one enemy and there's going to be, you know, some 40 odd enemies coming in and bosses and, you know, a system whereby you buy stuff for your ship and, and the character interactions and that sort of thing. If it's this fun now, it's probably going to turn out well if I can, uh, if I can pull it off. So that was the point where I thought, okay, I'm definitely in this one for the long haul. Well, you you definitely have so far, and I definitely plan on on getting back into it once the interview cool. is done for sure as well too. Uh, here, from a voice acting perspective, here, uh, did the script come together early in in the work process, or were, was it kind of put together later on, or did was it more of a as you went? Some of it evolved early. In the very beginning, I wasn't necessarily thinking of voice acting. Um, I did know I wanted to do briefings before every mission. Um, that's a throwback to. Wing Commander, which is not quite as early a game as those other games I mentioned, but still somewhere in the 80s, I think, or maybe early 90s, um, maybe 93 or so. And I loved in that game where every mission, you got a briefing from your commander who gave you at least a heads up on what maybe to expect. It wasn't always accurate, but here's what we expect you to face. Um, so I ended up writing those briefings as I went along and eventually realized, hey, rather than just have this text on the screen with these graphics, what if I also voiced it? And as I began voicing, I thought, you know, I have another really talented voice actor here. What if I turned her character um, into an actual voice character as well? And then what if we start interacting with the player during combat and, you know, calling out things that are, that are happening in a hopefully somewhat comedic, but also, also informative way to keep you on top of things. So it, it did evolve over time, but it really started with those briefings and realizing it would be better to have a human voice than just text. The top-down perspective of... Yeah, it's basically top-down perspective of of the game itself. Here, it is always fun to have because you're limited to just the vertical. You're sort yes. of horizontal, I should say. One play. And, yeah, one play. Right. Yeah. <laughs> the fun of that is, or rather, the strategy of that is, you know, you're in a fixed position pretty much. You have no way to avoid something if you've missed uh, an asteroid or whatever like that. There's no real way to do that other than the shield. Looking at the graphics of the game itself here, how did you design the Saturians versus just the simplicity of the ships from Earth? Like, what was the concept of that? Um, early on, I knew I definitely wanted a differentiation. I didn't want you just facing mirror images of what you would design on Earth. Um, so I wanted some alternate sensibility. But it wasn't until... Uh, the, the second... The very first ship I designed was just a drone, and it was just a, sort of a random idea of this... Well, something, something like an Earth drone, but with a central cannon pointed downward. But when I designed the second one, it had sort of a, an, an insectoid shape. It wasn't intentional. It just ended up that way with these sort of almost butterfly wings behind it and the two protruding cannons at the front like antennae. And that's when I decided to name it a wasp. And after that, I started going out of my way to say, how can I make things, you know, have insect overtones without, you know, I don't think they're necessarily an insectoid race. Maybe they are, maybe they're not. But, but I wanted the ships themselves to be easily named after insects and so you had to resemble something in a way so the next one you get is a spider that looks kind of like a spider later on there's one that looks very much like a death's head moth which is why it's called a death's head and uh, the centipede is literally a sinuous centipede that comes down um, so it was easy to name so uh yeah there was just sort of an effort to largely um keep them insectoid looking with the exception of some of the bosses some of the bosses i uh I went with a more traditional design just because I'm a Star Wars fan. So one of them looks kind of like a, a, an Imperial destroyer. And uh, one of them is a saucer because I wanted to have an explanation for why we've been seeing saucers allegedly on Earth for so long. So maybe they have been Saturnian ships coming in as a scouting force. So nice. that's the reason that a few, a few of the classics make an appearance as well. You have a long list of, of credits, obviously. You have you had a, a team of people helping you as well, too, at least from a playtester perspective, from what I can see briefly here. What was the feedback from your playtesters as the game was being developed to its its final state on Steam? It's been extremely helpful. Uh, to be honest, the very first feedback I got was the single most important feedback, and it was literally unanimous from every single player. Uh, when I put this out, some, some of my playtesters are classic shmup players, so I thought... My fear was I was going to get feedback back that, hey, this is just too easy. 
And I got the exact opposite. Everyone was like, oh my God, this is hard. Like uh, seasoned players of, you know, our type in this were saying, I can't get off level one. And I was like, what the hell? I get to level 25, no problem. It just takes practice. But, but it opened my eyes to the idea that I couldn't just release it with my own experience as a central guide, which is why we suddenly developed five different difficulty levels that can slow things down so you have a, a fighting chance. If you're not a seasoned player, you can drop it down to literally 50% of the speed where the aliens move at half speed and the shots come out at half speed. It makes a huge difference. But if you're, by contrast, much better player than me, you can crank it up to the opposite end where they're moving at like double speed, um, where, where I get my ass kicked on the first level. There's no way I can get off it on that. So that gave me a, a wider playing field of how I could develop the game because I knew that there was this cushion of things can't necessarily be too hard or too easy. They, they, they'll, they'll find their way in one of these slots, but also little tiny things like certain people had trouble with some of the, some of the graphics. They most recently there was um, when you get hit, there's sort of a damage pulsing image that just briefly shows up and then fades early on. One of my play testers said he didn't like the fact that it was always the same image. So today when I was looking for something, casting him up for something to do with only 13 days left to go, I'm still trying to find ways to improve it. I added a sort of a shimmering effect to that. So it's, it's not distracting, but it's quickly, uh, it shakes a bit. And it's based on the feedback of one of these individuals. Another one just mentioned the fact that stars should flicker. So in recent times, I started getting the stars. So if you look at them, it's very subtle. They are flickering and, and, and shimmering in and out of um, existence. So they, they've definitely helped a lot in, in various ways. Here, how was releasing it on Steam in terms of the process itself? Was it fairly easy? Was, it, uh, was there any roadblocks to that? So far, so good. Um, that said, I mean, it, technically, it doesn't release on Steam until the 18th of February 2022. So it's, it's up there as in you can go and wishlist it, but you can't actually purchase it yet. So we'll see what that process is like. There are a lot of um, details to that side of things that I was not anticipating. Um, they have these things called capsules, which are images to showcase your game, but you can't just have, here's my title page. You've got to have one at this resolution and you've got to have one that's, you know, cuts off the words. So if, if it's much narrower, so you have to reposition all the words and get everything to fit. You have one that's like, I don't know, like a thumbnail, but it still has to be legible. You have to have a little identifying um, symbol that people can see in their games list and recognize the symbol represents the game. These were things I wasn't anticipating. So that was that in itself was, was days and days of work just to get that sort of thing ironed out. And then of course, you know, how do you how do you put up a store page? I'm I'm notoriously bad at self promotion. I love creating work. I love writing. I love creating games. I love acting, but I'm never good at taking the time to say, "Hey, look at my stuff." Um, so trying to create a store page for somebody who has no business sensibilities is is used to a very socialist um, system of "I've made this game. Here it is for free. Take it if you want it." Um, was a real eye opener for me. Yeah, I. I... I definitely understand that aspect. A lot of my graphical knowledge came from trial and error and like the lower thirds and the title images and all that stuff right. came from a, a pain point of, well, I could just throw up a screenshot, but you know, no one's going to view it. So let's make it more interesting. <laughs> yeah, for sure. As a, as a game developer and also as an actor and as a writer, you know, how have those aspects of your varying careers helped you in terms of being the professional that you are? Acting has been my primary focus. Um, it's literally what, what I studied in university. I spent four years learning to be the color yellow and then came to Toronto to, to pursue a career as the color yellow or, or whatnot, whatever work I could find. That has been my primary focus. Um, the crappy thing about acting, to some degree, it's out of your hands. It's not like I had very naive expectations about how the process would work. Um, I thought coming to Toronto, it would be what, you know, when you see what American Idol is today, which is we're coming to your city. If you want to audition, come and audition, then you all get a fair shake. And if you're good enough, you move forward. It's not like that. You have to you have an agent. And then only if the agent submits you for a part, you don't even find out certain some of the parts where you, know, you were or weren't submitted to. And then if you get submitted to the part, then the casting director has to single you out and say, yes, I want this person. And then it's, it's, a, it's a long drawn out process. So literally a lot of it is waiting you know, you'd say in the old days, waiting for the phone to ring. Now it's waiting for the email. And in good times, I do get, you know, two or three auditions a week, which is great. It keeps me very busy. But in leaner times, um, it can be in a weeks where there's literally nothing. And it's, you, you can't ply your trade. You can't seek work. You just have to wait for the opportunity to try to seek work. Things like writing and things like game design give me an opportunity to get up each day and say, you know, whether somebody gives me the opportunity or not to work, I can work. 
I may not be able to turn this into a monetized piece of work. Sometimes I can, sometimes I can't. Every day I can get up and work my craft, whether the agent calls me or not. So that's the advantages of things like that. Then as a, as a writer, what have you created recently that you're maybe shipping around or maybe that has been already picked up that has been released to the public? I would highlight a few things. One is a screenplay that I wrote a long time ago, but we ended up shooting it uh, as a feature film in 2015. That is called Red Spring, post-apocalypse vampire film. Hmm. Um, I ended up directing it as well and editing it and doing all the visual effects and playing one of the characters. So I was very heavily involved in that film for years of my life. But it's all over the place now. It was way more successful than we anticipated. It got a DVD release. It's a uh, on Amazon Prime, it's on the Microsoft Store, uh, Hulu, Vudu, Tubi, like a million places. It even got a 13-week theatrical release, which we were not expecting at all. Um, so that was a, a really exciting uh, project for me, Red Spring. I also have a few books out. I have a novel called Dawn at the Royal Star that you can pick up on Amazon. It's about a... Uh, it takes place in the equivalent of the Royal York Hotel, cleverly renamed to the Royal Star Hotel so I don't get sued. Um, and it's about, um, it's sort of a sci-fi story of what happens to all these important and, and wealthy and, and not so wealthy guests who are staying in the hotel when time outside the hotel suddenly stops and the only living bastion of life on the planet seems to be in the hotel and they can't get out. I also have a book of short stories called Paths Through the Dark um, that you can pick up likewise on Amazon if you were to look for that. Some things I have to look forward to. Then. This is good. You're just filling my pandemic bookshelf. That's wonderful. <laughs> nice. <laughs> How would you consider yourself as an actor? What, what is your strength? My strengths, I would say, are that I can very rapidly lose myself in a character. And I, it's a weird phrase to say, and I don't even mean it literally. It's not like I, I it, it almost seems to imply like I, I, it literally states that I lose myself. And that's not true. I'm still aware of my surroundings and that sort of thing. But I can sink into a character fast and occupy that space. Um, so I find I'm, I'm very good at cold reads. You know, if you hand me a script, I can usually um, make it seem like I've already studied it, that sort of thing. That would be a, a definite strength. Weaknesses, again, would come down to self-promotion and, um, and honestly, uh, in retrospect, a large lack of educating myself on the business end of things that I think cost me dearly years and years and years of my time. Uh, spent pushing hard in the wrong direction because I was ignorant about how the business worked and I didn't take the time to learn that. Um, so lesson learned, but lesson learned 17 years later than I wish it had been learned. Was it more of a networking side of things or? No, it was um, things to do with, for instance, uh, I, I don't know how much you know about the uh, the Canadian film world, but there there's a union and a non-union world. And I got into the union early, which is really a, a target goal for for actors, but I had a really bad experience with it. I thought I did. I actually was having a really bad experience. I didn't realize with my agent, it was a bad representation at the time, but I interpreted that as bad time in the union. So I left the union and then spent years on the outside for years, decades, even in the non-union world, I was extremely sought after. I was booking, you know, I do two feature films a year, five or six short films, a couple of TV shows and a few commercials. And it was great. It seemed, but the pay scale between that world and the non-union world is vast. And more importantly, success in the non-union world does not translate to the union world. So I always kind of assumed that as I racked up credit after credit and, and, and won award after award, somebody on some you know, major network TV show is going to be like, hey, this guy matters. But it turns out when I finally got back in the union, people had no clue who I was because mm -hmm. that stuff just doesn't hit the radar. Yeah, I'm, I'm from Windsor, Ontario as well, too. So I, oh, I, as am I. Yeah. yeah. In fact, here's a, here's a funny tidbit. Um, you were in the movie The Control, which yes. I was also uh, at the DIT as well as a, a oh, nice. scientist as well. So Nice. Yeah. Mike Stasco and Eric Schiller are wonderful people. The Ted Bezer as well. Yeah. Great, great people. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. yeah. So I saw your name. I'm like, I got to talk to this guy. He's doing a video uh, game. Yeah, he's <laughs> an actor. So, you know, hey, local roots. Got to love it. Cool. Now that everything is is coming your way in terms of success with the video game and and i can't wait to see the response from from the public on february 18th as well too so that that's going to be amazing to see um what's next in in your life and your career as a, either as an actor or as a as a game developer as an actor one can never say it again that comes back to that central problem like i've had a couple of auditions so far this year uh January and February are notoriously slow every year. It's just the way it is. And the pandemic isn't um, helping that. 
so hopefully things will pick up again more into March and April, but I literally have no way to forecast. It's just my agent will contact me and say, Hey, you have an audition for Handmaid's Tale. And I'll be like, great, give it a shot and hopefully you know, book something. But no way to forecast that. As far as game design goes, there are a few things. Um, part of it's going to be dictated by how well or not well Saturnians does. Um, because I do want to continue supporting it. I, I actually have some ideas I want to add into the game after it's even released, just as free DLC. Um, so part of my time, I think, will be occupied with that. But I also really want to experience what I experienced in the early days of working on Stop the Saturnians again, which is a constant opportunity to learn. So I think I want to try my hand at something more 3D, maybe something Wing Commander style, I don't know. But just because it'll give me an opportunity to dive into something I've never experienced before and, and again, get up every day and watch some YouTube videos and be like, how do I do this? Great. And by the end of the day, feel a sense of satisfaction that I've you know, gone someplace I've never gone before in terms of, uh, of that. One of, I think, for me, one of the most uh, iconic, at least space games that I played continuously was of course x-wing versus tie fighter and the x-wing series and and tie fighter the, the those both solo individual things and the ability to you know fly the ships from a first person's perspective and everything like that is just kind of really just blew me out of the water even though the graphics at the time were amazing i mean looking back they were really bad yeah it's but, fl flat shaded polygons yeah exactly yeah but um Apparently, they did a a 4K remake of that entire series. Oh, I wasn't aware. I know Rogue Squadron I have on the Xbox One. I haven't been playing it lately, but it's a yeah multiplayer chance to hop in an X wing or a Tie fighter and and duke it out. That's a that's an absolute blast for sure. Yeah. So the um so the remake of those games X wing and Tie fighter and X wing versus Tie fighter um got a 4k update and it looks beautiful so there's some nice. videos on on youtube if you ever look that up but you know taking stop the saturians and and going from top view third person into a first person would be pretty incredible as well too i think that would be something to yeah. really like but you're still forced side to side but i could i could theoretically put it in the same universe yeah if, uh, you know obviously a different um different scenario so you wouldn't just be defending the earth as you are here but um yeah, maybe maybe in the same universe, just to expand on the lore and keep the characters alive, maybe fun. It'd be interesting, but because I could see that as a first person, it just it would be so awesome just to see things flying at you too. It'd be incredible. <laughs> I mean, you're safe in your your digital bubble, but still. <laughs> Do you believe in creative block? Yeah. Do I believe in it? I mean, I, I suppose to some degree I've experienced it. Do I believe it exists as a, as a, you know, a, a physical entity? No, it's just a matter of finding a way around it or finding a new way of approaching a problem. Um, and that could literally be stopping the project for now and working on a different project to shake things up. So I've definitely experienced blocks, but usually it's because I've, especially with writing, I've reached, I've reached points in a story where it feels like the story isn't going to work anymore. And sometimes that's because it's not going to. And in those cases, it's not just a question of approaching it from a different angle. It's because I realize either some fundamental flaw in the story or I've lost interest, in which case the story is just as dead either way because you can't write, you know, you have a passion and drive to do so. But most of the time I find it's just a matter of shifting gears. I usually have several projects on the go. Like even now with, even while working on Stop the Saturnians, I have another game that I've been working on for 27 years. I work on that in the background. That's Caverns of Zaskazian 2. So sometimes if I was really not wanting to be in space, I would go into a dungeon instead and work on caverns or or obviously auditions do break things up. You know, even if you're in a good groove on a project, suddenly you've got to shift gears and, and think in a totally different discipline. So um, having multiple art forms to play with, I think is a, is a definite blessing that helps you get around things like creative block. At what point are we good enough? That, I mean, that requires some form of metric. And I guess that would also have to, you'd have to break down as to what you're, what you're measuring. I guess in, in the answer to that, I'll, I'll refer back to two things I already said was one that I, as an example for myself, I do get up each day excited for each day. So if your metric of good enough is be happy, which is really, I think, the object of life, in that regard, I'd say personally, I'm, I'm good enough. But on the other hand, as, as the day wears on and I get tired and I start thinking about things, other things I mentioned, like a 17-year, that's a very specific number, a 17-year gap where I wanted to be. 
you know, I, I start feeling less so. I think we're all good enough at all times. It's just a question of deciding what metric you want to use. Um, and uh, it's probably useful to remember for myself, even when I start getting down, that perhaps I missed some opportunities earlier to reflect on the fact that I'm genuinely happy doing what I'm doing. So maybe it's not, uh, not the end of the world to have missed a few opportunities. What is one mistake that you'll never, ever do again? Check your phone messages. Years ago, I went home for Christmas and it was at a time in my life when I wasn't getting a lot of work. I, I knew a gentleman uh, named Ralph who had a TV show uh, called The Jane Show. And he had written me a very specific character, written a character just for me because he'd seen me in a short film. And he's like, I want you to play this. And he called and he left a message and I didn't get back to him. And then he called and left another message and I didn't get back to him. And about fourth or fifth message, he finally said, look, I don't know where you are. I'm gonna have to give this to somebody else. And then I got home from vacation. I was like, God damn, man, that was an opportunity handed to me on a platter to catapult my career forward. And I just didn't do it because I was opening Christmas presents. So always, always, always check your messages. Given the choice that you could have dinner with anyone in the world, live or dead, who would that be? Wow. Interesting. There are certainly family members that I miss. Um, my grandparents in particular, I would love to spend more time with. Um, if we are sticking in the realm of the live, if we're talking in the realm of the fantasy people I've never had dinner with, Stephen King, I think. Um, I admire the man's, uh, well, I, I definitely admire the man's writing, but I also admire his politics. I think he's very outspoken in a, a fashion that appeals to my personal political sensibilities. Um, so I would love to, A, praise him for that, B, bask in that liberalism, and C, absorb whatever I could from his, uh, his wisdom. What could you pay more attention to in life? I do tend to spend a lot of time either... Well, either locked in dreams about what I'm going to you know, do for the next project. When I work, all I'm thinking about is going home so I can work, but I am fantasizing about that um, as opposed to, you know, enjoying the moment while I'm at my day job, for instance. And by contrast, sometimes, you know, I do have a tendency, again, when I'm, especially if I get down to dwell on mistakes in the past, as opposed to focusing on, again, what's going on in the present, or, or for that matter, I guess, even, even things that worked out in the past. But um, yeah, trying to, trying to remain present is a, uh, a definite challenge, maybe for anybody creative, maybe that's an imagination thing, maybe it's just in mind wanders, I don't know. But for me, certainly it is very rare that you don't catch me. If I'm silent, I'm probably thinking about something else and it's probably fantasizing about something else. Um, and I don't mean that in any lewd way that my wife's gonna see later and mistake, uh, just my mind wanders is all I'm saying. Mm, uh, yeah, I mean, a good idea will take us somewhere else, it always happens. Or a bad idea will take us somewhere else, it always happens. Sure. Here's a two-parter for you. If your life was a movie, what would its title be? And what would the soundtrack be for it? Oh, frick. Um, whoa. First title that came to mind was very negative. Let's get out of that space. Um, <laughs> you know what? The title would be I'm Trying. I think that's the best I can... I guess that's, the, that's the least negative title I can think of. I'm Trying. I think the soundtrack... I, I don't have... A, I'm not, I'm not well-versed in bands. I think it would be Hopeful with melancholy and mournful notes from time to time. If I could have anybody compose it, Adrian Ellis is a film composer we used on Red Spring. He's also the gentleman who composed all the music for Stop the Saturnians. He's freaking brilliant. I love everything he's ever done. And he's usually my favorite part of any project I'm involved in where he's working on it. Um, so I get him to do it. But yeah, I'm trying with hope and melancholy intertwined. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Probably the, um, <clears throat> the main person who would come to mind is a gentleman named Pitt. Um, his real name is Glenn Petrie. He was one of several high school drama teachers, but he's the one who created an environment where theater was a central joy in my life. Um, he, not, not just actually acting, that was part of it, but you know, whether it was working on a set, whether it was you know, painting a stage, whether it was selling tickets, it didn't matter. Everything I did that he had a hand in that had to do with theater was golden and wonderful. So he certainly is instrumental on in, in putting me in, in the path towards uh, the film and, and, and theater worlds. From a professional perspective, you have, well, you are a successful actor, you are a successful writer, and now you will become a successful video game developer, at least. I, I believe it will be successful, so it'll, it will be successful. <laughs> Do you consider yourself personally successful? I'm, I'm genuinely happy on a moment-to-moment, on -moment, -moment, day-to-day basis. I'm usually happy, which I guess means success. I mean, what else is there? We're on a journey from womb to grave, and you try and be happy in between, so I guess that's success. I, I'm thrilled with late 
late accomplishments, but I guess the operative word would be late. I feel, I feel very, very, very behind schedule, which is not something that would have bothered me when I was younger, but as you get older and you start realizing, Oh, wait a minute, there is a deadline on this life thing. You know, 17 years is a lot of ground to make up. And that's a number that I, I have come back to in my own personal assessment of uh, mistakes repeatedly. So uh, in that regard, I say no. It's difficult. I mean, we've all had issues and choices and things not go our way, unfortunately, but we're still alive and we, we do what we can to make that. That's true. Better. I'm trying. <laughs> yeah, that should be a short fail. <laughs> <laughs> The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? I think for me, the way I deal with it is, is throwing myself into another project or whatever project is ongoing. You know, if it's a, whether you're talking about something short term failure, like just a, a catastrophic or embarrassing audition, which occasionally happens, um, it's great to come home and, and lose yourself again in another, in another art form. Um, or if it's a, uh, I don't know, a job application that it's just not going your way. Um, knowing you have something that's going well uh, is, is great to come back to. So I, yeah, I think my repeated answer to that is, is having art is, I guess, therapy um, as a therapeutic that you can turn to, especially if you have either multiple disciplines or multiple projects ongoing in case one's not going well and that becomes a failure. It gives you a great chance to uh, escape from any sense of uh, permanence or, or tragedy associated with failure. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as an actor or a writer, or maybe through this interview, a video game developer of some kind. So they are looking to be creative in some way, shape or form. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? I think for me, that would be follow, trust your instincts and follow your passion because the last thing we need is art informed by template or, or ledger. Um, so rather than chasing the latest trend of, hey, this was successful, let's duplicate that. There's something inside you that needs to get out. That's what art is, right? Um, so whatever that is, I guarantee you it has an audience. Someone's going to feel the same way you do. Um, so pursue that with all of your effort and all of your heart. I think that that will hopefully leave a, 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 the world a better place because something's in it that wouldn't have been there were it not for you. I do hate to say this, Jeff, but that ends this particular episode of Two Weeks Talking. Uh, before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you on the internet? And of course, where can we find Stop the Saturians? Um, so you can find me on Twitter at, at Jeff Sinisak, all one word. Um, I also have a Facebook page, Jeff Sinisak bracket actor slash writer end bracket for stop the saturnians it is on steam um i don't know i can't give you a a, a direct link because they produce a link that has like numbers and such in it so i don't i don't know what the, heck the link is but if you look for either my name or for uh, stop the saturnians as as written at the bottom of the screen i think i can't quite read if that's spelled yeah, right but hopefully it is it is then uh yeah then you'll uh you'll you'll find uh you'll find the game there and uh, even though it's not out yet comes out on February 18th. There is a little button called add to wish list and steam uses the number of people who click that button as the algorithm for how hard they push the game. So although I would love you to buy it, even if you have no intention of doing so, merely clicking that button will improve my life immeasurably. So please do so. Well, thanks Jeff so much for coming on the show. I do greatly appreciate it. I'd love to have you back on. We'll, we'll talk video games. We'll talk more acting, et cetera. I'd love to dive into your career as an actor, as well as a writer too. So once I pick up some of those other books there, I'll, I'll be happy to, to pick your brain from a, a creative and sci-fi perspective there. I, I love those types of stories. So you Oh, that'd be great. Interest. I really appreciate it, Kurt. Thank you. <laughs> Anytime. Like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. Of course, you can find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, twogeekstalking.com or tgtmedia.com. And of course, on our YouTube channel, which is a little more updated than our website because I'm only one person, which is youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that up. Thanks for listening watching on Two Geeks Talking.